to DSO Live once again with us for round two <laughs> is Elizabeth McLean talking about the organ symphony that's coming up. Now, symphonies don't usually include organs, so why might Sanson have chosen to use it in his third symphony? Well, there's a few reasons. One is that the Royal Philharmonic Society commissioned this because he was very popular in England. In fact, maybe more popular than he was in France at that time. Mm -hmm. And in 1879, he had played in their performance venue, which is, I think, St. James Hall in Piccadilly then. He loved that organ. He wanted to write for it. He shows up for the premiere, I think around 1886, completely different organ. Okay. So he'd written with this instrument in mind, these particular pedals and pipes. It did not work at all. He was very <laughs> disappointed. So subsequently, organists have, you know, they, they get to know their instrument in advance and they know how to work around it. Um, but on a more personal level, just like our soloist for the piano concerto, mm -hmm. uh, Sati, or I almost said Sati, Sanson yeah. mm -hmm. was a virtuosic performer as a child. So okay. he picked up piano very easily as a kid. I think he was about two and a half when he starts playing. By the time he's five, he's composing. Wow. He has his public debut at 10, but there's not a lot of a market mm -hmm. for keyboardists. So he was directed pretty quickly towards the organ so that he could work for churches. He worked in a couple, mm -hmm. uh, Saint Marie and the, the Madeleine, which was the official church of the uh, Second Empire. Very, very important positions. So he had a background with this instrument. Okay, so is it uncommon for Parisian organists to compose symphonies? It may have been before, but not after Saint-Saëns. Uh, everyone from César Franck to even Charles Tournemire and Olivier Messiaen in the 20th century, they composed music not just for the organ, but also for symphonic concert halls and a few other venues. One of the interesting things about the Conservatoire after 1848, when they revise and update the curriculum, is that they did not group their organ classes with, say, piano or any other keyboard class, they grouped it in the same section as things like harmony, which would be their music theory courses, and composition, because they saw the organ more as something that you improvise on than okay. necessarily perform repertoire. Okay. So um, we usually hear organs in churches and in synagogues. Does that mean we should think about Sanson's organ symphony as religious? This is going to sound funny because I introduced myself as a scholar, well, you introduced me, yes. as a scholar of music and spirituality. Yes, I, I was wondering what that meant. But <laughs> one of the tricks with studying anything that has any religious signification in the late 19th and 20th century is that some of these composers did not believe in these forms. Okay. So based on what we know about Sanson and what he said about himself, he was probably a deist, someone who believed God exists and kind of set things in motion, but was either asleep at the wheel or did not care mm -hmm. to have that personal relationship. Mm -hmm. So what makes this um, an important work though is because it has the influence of the organ. You can hear plain chant, which is exactly what organists would have used and improvised and built melodies on. Rather than playing Bach in their services, they would have, they would have played pieces more like that. So part of this, I, I noticed in the program notes, which are beautifully written, they mentioned that Sanson had a number of academic interests. Okay. And he was actually part of this thing called the Société um, Académique de Musique Sacrée. He was the official organist, and that is the <laughs> academic society for sacred music. Okay. So he's more interested in religious music for its sort of historical significance right, not and performing it proper to the emotions they needed. Um, Something that is fascinating is one reason he left his last organ job was because he disagreed <laughs> with the clergy. Mm. Weirdly enough, they wanted him to play more music from operas, okay. more popular music. Yeah, that and, people knew. Yeah, and less music that actually sounded sacred. So it's a, it's a bit of a confusing situation there. Okay, so yeah. as a mu music composer yourself, mm -hmm. for a lay person like me, how difficult is it to compose music? I think it's incredibly difficult. I'm okay. one of those people that I have to have a theme Okay. And, and build from there. Mm -hmm. But that's what organists were taught to do. Mm -hmm. um, there's this story told by Satie's, or Saint-Saëns, apologies, Saint-Saëns' uh, friend, his biographer, mm -hmm. that he would show up late to mass, he would run up the stairs, like skipping four steps at a time, <laughs> he'd be like panting, have an ashen face, just sweating, and he'd sit down and play the most solemn, perfect, flawless piece that he improvised. So okay. even Vidor said his improvisations were perfect, they could be compositions. So I think for him it was a bit easier. Mm -hmm. So, uh, t you know, this is your first time on mm -hmm. DSO Live, mm -hmm. and we're so happy to have you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You're headed off to Paris uh, yes. to study. <laughs> so I'm right now writing a dissertation on Olivier Messiaen, who's a 20th century organist and 
uh, composer, unlike Saint-Saëns, he was very devout. Mm -hmm. So you will see in his music where he's actually trying to inscribe the theology and how he writes the parts. Whereas with the organ symphony, Saint-Saëns going more for that, you know, clarity and balance and these French musical values and the, the, the construction of it all. Um, Messiaen was very worried about that. So yeah, in a few weeks I'll get to go see, hopefully, if everything goes <laughs> according to plan, get to see some new documents that have only been available to scholars for a few months now okay. about Olivier Messiaen's life, so it'll yeah. be very exciting. And how long will you be there? Elizabeth? About six weeks. About six weeks. Yeah. Okay, bring us something back, okay? <laughs> <laughs> if I can get all of Paris back, that would be perfect, but at least we have this little taste of Paris here yeah. in Detroit. And then you continued your schooling in hopes yes. of getting your PhD. Yes, so I should be finished with, well, with my doctorate soon once I finish the dissertation. Well, thank you so yep. much for thank joining you. us. We can't wait to have you back Thanks, again. I'm looking forward to it. We hope you enjoy the second half of the concert. We'll be back next week for more French music with guest artists and twins, Michelle and Christina Naughton. Live from Orchestra Hall is presented by Ford Motor Company Fund, made possible by generous support from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. I'm Dana Clark. Enjoy the second half.